Once again, good morning to everyone who has joined on time. We're about to get started uh, with our publication launch of the paper Cloud Computing as a Key Enable for Digital Government Across Asia and the Pacific. And we are just waiting for a few more of the participants to join us. In the meantime, uh, let me just give a few uh, instructions on how to best uh, use Zoom for this webinar. Um, you are asked to please use the Q&A function for comments and questions, which we can then take up during our Q&A uh, portion of the event, which will be after presentations uh, by our speakers. We're kicking off this morning with a short address by the Chief of Digital Technology for Development in ADB, uh, my colleague Thomas Abel. And then we will have a presentation given by the lead author of the report, Mayan Lim, and uh, she will be given the, giving the uh, key points of the paper. And then there'll be three respondents uh, from government, from industry, and from ADB. It will be followed by discussion where we will pick up on your questions if you put them through the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, and then, uh, uh, Thomas Abel will be facilitating the discussion. So thanks again for joining this morning. And I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Thomas Abel, to give his remarks and to kick off the webinar. Thanks, Arndt. And uh, thanks, uh, Mayan, for your great work on the report. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, you know, this is a really important topic for uh, development and, you know, for the region. And, and it's a good timing, you know, as uh, the pandemic is coming to an end and uh, people have seen the transition to the digital economy accelerate over the course of the pandemic. Um, and within ADB, our unit is relatively new um, as ADB has uh, become more and more uh, focused on digital technology as a key enabler for development. Um, we are uh, currently, um, about 15% of ADB projects have very significant technology components, um, you know, coming from our uh, history of mainly focusing on um, traditional infrastructure. And, um, you know, as we've seen during the pandemic, the kinds of digital technologies that we need to invest in more are uh, becoming very obvious. One, obviously, is connectivity. We still have many people who are not connected. But I would say the second one after connectivity is basically cloud because almost all of the public computing and services that are essential for our um, economic development now are served out, out of um, cloud uh, technologies. And, and cloud computing is in some ways becoming the next infrastructure for the digital economy. Um, you, know, in, uh, you, you know, start with basic infrastructure, water, power, uh, transport, and then um, you add connectivity for digital, and, and now cloud is another layer. And so ADB, we really want to understand how governments can more effectively use uh, cloud technologies, because it's a little more complicated with governments understanding the, um, the security and cost implications. And so this paper really is a, a chance to for us to kind of bring some of these uh, thoughts together. And so um, I think the panel today will cover that and, uh, and Mayan will, will do a very nice summary of the paper for folks who haven't had a chance to, uh, to look, look at it yet. So uh, with that, uh, I'll uh, thank everybody once again and hand it back to Arndt for the next presentation. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our speaker and the lead author of the report, which is uh, Lim Mayan. She's a director at Access Partnership Singapore and the executive director of the Asia Cloud Computing Association. Mayan has extensive experience in public policy, technology policy development and government relations communications across Asia Pacific and has worked with many global, regional and local uh, organizations such as APEC, ASEAN, the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council and the Asia Internet Coalition on thought leadership development, uh, government outreach, and stakeholder engagement, such as the development of the ASEAN ICT Master Plan 2020. Mayan's career has spanned global, regional, and local institutions, including the World Bank, World Vision, 
the Singapore Institute of International Affairs and the Singapore Internet Project. Based in Singapore, Mayan also lectures on Infocom policy at her alma mater, the National University of Singapore. We're very proud to have her as the lead author of our paper. And over to you, Mayan, for the presentation of our new working paper. There's CV. I feel a bit embarrassed by, by the introduction, but thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity for, for our AEB to be sharing uh, you know, a lot of the expertise that we've learned uh, in the Asia Cloud Computing Association, as well as the work that we do at, well, previously TRPC, now Access Partnership. So without further ado, I am told that I have 12 minutes to tell you about this paper, which is really focused on cloud computing as a key enabler for digital government across Asia and the Pacific. One of the things I really, really want to highlight and really want to encourage all of you who are, are watching uh, is that I've got amazing panelists. I've got Kelly, we've got Marcus, and I believe uh, Pasemi is also will be joining us. Uh, I really feel that you, if you're, if you have implementation questions, you really should be asking them as well as myself um, that uh, about the implementation issues, because I think that amongst us, we have a wealth of information and knowledge on how this all goes. So without further ado, this is the paper, Cloud Computing as a Key Enabler. And I won't cover the definitions of cloud computing because I believe that most of us are fairly familiar with the definitions of cloud computing infrastructure as a service platform, as a service, software as a service. And in many cases, it's not X as a service. Anything can be a service, but these are the, the general uh, deployment models. Uh, in terms of how you want to deploy cloud, we understand it as you know, you can actually deploy cloud for the government in a couple of ways, private cloud or public cloud or hybrid cloud. Private cloud is usually where everybody starts with, you know, you have your own little server or you have a server room and you've been distributing resources, computing resources to your staff uh, based on what you have. But now you realize that, hey, you can actually borrow other people. You can actually rent uh, cloud from other people. And that is uh, public cloud where you can actually say, okay, this is not really owned by me, it's maintained by other people, but hold on, can I actually do a mixture of that? And that's where we get to hybrid cloud, which is uh, personally one of my, my favorite things to do because I think that that's actually a way that we can best get the best of both worlds. So <clears throat> in terms of <clears throat> cloud computing for the government, how, where are we seeing its deployment? We're seeing its deployment in the form of either a cloud first or a cloud by default approach. And these are policies which are written. And I really encourage you to ask Marcus all about this because this is something which I know he is definitely spearheading uh, the concepts of cloud first, uh, cloud by default. It's where governments, the government sector prioritizes the use and procurement of cloud systems by default, where a, wherever a secure, a reliable and cost effective cloud computing option exists. And this is usually accompanied by a whole of government approach towards take uh, towards technology pub, uh, policy making, where governments revisit the manner in which government services are administered. I'm going to give you uh, a, a case study soon and just really run to what Korea did because I don't want to, to sugarcoat it. A lot of people tell you that moving on to cloud is a very simple thing. It is a very, very simple thing. What happens after you want to deploy cloud is that you actually need to look into all of the different systems which interlock into cloud computing. And um, I see that Pasemi is online. I think that you can ask Pasemi a lot about uh, a lot about the the work that the Indonesian government has been doing and what he has been pulling his hair out on uh, to make sure that a lot of the systems are actually uh, well connected, well interconnected, and and can uh, can be talking to each other. So, what is driving and what has been trending in cloud computing developments within the the, the government sector? There's been a lot of work in clean tech. Agritech, fintech, health tech, a lot of X tech. I think that COVID nineteen has definitely driven a lot of work done in uh, the use of cloud computing and that expandable resource. Health tech in particular has been uh, particular has been interesting, and I'm going to run through really quickly, like I promised, what has been happening in South Korea. South Korea developed this an epidemic investigation support system or EISS. Uh, this is obviously in Korean. I can't read Korean um, as much as I like Korean dramas. Cannot read Korean, so let me. Get you the English version instead, which is this. This is the city data hub and this is the entire modules 
that are developed on the cloud. So when they moved onto cloud, not only did they need to move onto cloud, you can see the legacy platform on the left, but they also had to work through the databases, which you can see in the center, the semantic database, the anal analysis database, and they had to work out which systems would be talking to each other. The legal process also would be, have to be arranged. So this is where they mapped out the legal process of tracking uh, data and as well as they, they had in Korea, they had a, a process where they were tracking uh, credit card data. I think that this was related to location data, which I know is a little bit controversial, but uh, this is what they did. And the, you can see what they, what they needed to do further to map out the approval processes, etc. So everything in orange, uh, in the little numbers, those are the processes that needed to be mapped out. This is the contact tracing, which because they moved onto the cloud, they could therefore put in place. This is the uh, hotspots presentation, which they could pivot the data that they had and show from a mapping. So not only could they contact trace, but they could actually also location trace. And I thought that this is a really, really good uh, example of how cloud computing can really, you can start small, but it can definitely scale to something which is very, very powerful and very, very important, uh, especially in time of health crisis. So in terms of cloud computing for government, some stories, some other stories from the field would be, you know, in terms of what the benefit is, number one, it helps you reduce costs. Uh, so for example, in Singapore, the Singapore Land Authority, they save 60% going to cloud as opposed to planning for an on-prem DC, a data center build. Uh, Philippines Bureau of Customs, I believe, spent 10% of its original cost estimates when they decided to uh, go to public cloud rather than to build their own DC, which is a, a massive amount of savings. So that's number one, the benefit to you if you're thinking, should I move to cloud or not? The second thing is that cloud computing streamlines operations and improves efficiency. So I've given you some examples which can be seen within the paper itself. Philippines DICT reduced a two to three day process to a 30 minutes to one or two day process, which is fantastic. Um, the South Australian Department for Communities and Social Inclu uh, Inclusion, this is amazing because it has to do with financial inclusion, which I think you can ask Kelly about. They reduced a four to six week payment processing time to less than three days, which is like massively important if you know people are, are really having a tough time with COVID-19 difficulties right now. To reduce that, that payment schedule from four to six weeks payment to more less than three days is really, really amazing. And I think that that's really important as we deal with financial inclusion issues. Cloud computing improves agility, allows public services to scale. I think that this is fairly self-explanatory. It improves resilience with better business continuity and disaster recovery, Western Australia had a massive power outage and thanks to the cloud, they were only they were able to limit the, the amount of data loss I believe that they had to only four to five minutes before the failover kicked in, which is I mean, really, really important because after all, you want to make sure that people don't mess up your land records. Uh, and also cloud computing facilitates human resource development because instead of keeping people who are going to be stuck in one sort of language only, for example, COBOL, which my father programmed in, uh, we actually have cloud computing, which re requires you to be continu continuously improving the way and the efficiencies of the computing languages that you use, which is really, really good. So what are some of the barriers? We've put up three barriers and, and some solutions to cloud adoption by, cloud go by governments. The first is that governments um, are often really worried about the lack of processes for data protection and security. My data may not be secure. So we're, the question is really what is safe, what is not? Uh, we want to propose, and it's again found in the paper, we want to propose that you could look at cloud security certifications as one assurance mechanism. And they're not, there's not just one cloud security certification that's available. There are actually quite a lot that are available. So uh, please do read the paper and like, let us know about, the, about that. Um, the second barrier is a poor understanding of cloud cost structures and the utility procurement model. How do you write down legacy infrastructure? How do you buy on utility? How do you estimate costs in order to get budget, uh, budget approval? And anonymous attendee, I see that one of the questions that you have is, can you please enlighten us on cost and ROI of public versus private versus hybrid cloud? Thank you for that question. In the paper itself, you'll see that I've actually included some screenshots of the 
uh, cost calculators that you can, can look at. And there are cost calculators for both services as well as DCs. So do read the paper. The, the links are provided for the sources. So you can go around, go on the online and play around with the cost calculators there. So please do understand that it definitely is, we completely understand there's a barrier to understanding uh, how to procure cloud and also what the cost structures are. So thank you for that. The third question is, um, human resource legacy issues in skill development and acquisition. How can I hire? Who can I hire? How do I retain uh, strong, strong workers in terms of maintaining my, my infrastructure? I think that there needs to be put in place a workforce retraining and a reform of uh, human resource management. And again, you can look at the uh, report that that which is completely free, by the way. How much is the report and is it free to attendees is one of the questions. Completely free, I think. Uh, Arndt is typing in answers, so I'll let him deal with that. But yes, this is something that is uh, pretty, pretty important for all of us to understand. So in terms of how governments can effectively adopt cloud computing, we want to encourage you two things. Number A, create pro-cloud regulatory conditions is A, and B, create a robust cloud strategy and adoption plan. I think creating a pro-cloud regulatory conditions, those are the pre- those are the, the things that you can prepare for. So for example, note that data localization does not equate to data security. Don't demand that the data must stay in, in the country because that is not equatable to data security. Make sure that you enable cross-border data transfer. So for, look into APEX CBPR, look into ISO IEC 27000 series, see how you can start to enable cross-border data transfers. And this is where I think the financial services sector has definitely taken a lead in. So you can actually go and ask your, Financial, provi financial providers, financial regulators, hey, what have you guys enabled in terms of cross-border data transfers? We'd also encourage you, number three, to implement the data classification framework. So you can look at what's, uh, what's been done in the UK, Australia, Philippines, and Singapore. Um, and we would also really encourage you to address central and local government policy conflicts. I think that there have been some ex examples um, in uh, Japan's PIPA where they started with the personal information protection um, uh, and then they, they realized that there was a conflict between the federal law and the local law and they had to work it out. Um, the Philippines uh, also has a, has, a, has a case study, which I've written out in the paper. So have a really quick look at it. I want to move very quickly into the last section, which is how do you create a robust strategy and adoption plan? Here's the steps that we've put. Prioritize and define the scope of cloud migration. Consider small projects and small pilots to, to gain migration experience. Establish, we want to encourage you, establish a new government unit to coordinate cloud transitions for the public sector. Number four, build on existing solutions created by others. And number five, create a strong cloud foundation for innovation narrative for the public sector. So how do you want to do this? Uh, here's where we have more detail in the paper where we show you, you know, five steps on how you can actually prioritize and define the scope of government cloud migration, because I think it's quite difficult for us to be moving, you know, from a, I think I want to move into cloud and then suddenly realize that you have to do something like where, where Korea is. But I think that we have a pretty good map, a pretty good process that I think that we can speak with the ADB a little bit more about. So please feel free to download the paper and we are very happy to be chatting with you about about this. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm going to turn the time back to Arndt. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, who is from the government of Indonesia. And we're very happy to welcome uh, Samuel, Samuel Pangarapan, who is the Director General of Application and Informatics at the Ministry of Communication and Informatics of the Republic of Indonesia. He has 20 plus years of experience leading a telecommunication business and actively participates in national and international organizations relating to the governance and use of the internet. In his government role, Paksemi is focused on accelerating Indonesia's digital transformation agenda in three fields, namely society, econ economy, and government. His department's initiatives which are carried out jointly with various stakeholders aimed to create a conducive climate for digital development while increasing and encouraging investment and economic development. Uh, over to you, Paksemi, and very much welcome from our side. Thank you, Art. Uh, uh, may I thank you also for the presentation, very uh, compelling, and I think if you uh, 
can share, I can uh, learn more from your uh, presentation uh, beside the, 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 the study. So uh, thank you. So uh, I think this is uh, it's like uh, helping Indonesia uh, on this. This study will really, really helping because we are designed to move to cloud. For this year, every uh, ICT spending have to be uh, scrutinized by me and then make sure there is no more uh, uh, building the data center. As you know, in Indonesia now have 200, uh, 2,700 data center scattered and then we are stopped. And then uh, there is no more uh, data center. So we are uh, forcing them to uh, move to the cloud, start this year. So uh, even uh, right now, we already uh, uh, we are going to build uh, because government will build. Uh, we will use a, a hybrid uh, a data center. Some is uh, uh, two or three uh, will be uh, built by the government, but the rest is going to be uh, using the public uh, public cloud uh, because uh, you know uh, we are a big country and I don't think so we can uh, build all by our own. That's why we are going to use uh, the uh, public uh, cloud also. So. Uh, <clears throat> I think I, I agree with the, the, the study. So uh, the planning should be there because right now most of the government agency they are worried about how to move uh, to cloud. They worry about the security. They worry about anything. This is uh, uh, I, I, what I explained to them. It's the same thing like you are managing your uh, your data center, but this is virtual virtual uh, uh, data center, so you don't have to worry. And then I think it's more secure than uh, what we are building our own uh, data center. So in Indonesia, uh, since uh, we are re uh, revising our uh, GR82 to GR71, this is the, the, uh, the, the plan is, is there. So we are, uh, they are differentiate between the government, uh, government and the public uh, on, and the private sector. Private sector, we also push them also now is to use to use the cloud, but we are still now negotiating or try to explain to the financial sector because such financial sector in Indonesia still uh, uh, all all mindsets they, they worry too much. <laughs> this is what we want to move also to to push them to move to the cloud. But for the government, we are strongly uh, support this, and then we're going to move to that. Uh, uh, to cloud. So um, I think uh, on the government planning, so first uh, we're going to uh, issue the cloud first policy, uh, which is uh, right now we already have, but this is a surgical, still a surgical letter from the minister. But uh, this year we will finish. And then on that uh, uh, minister uh, uh, regulation, we uh, give the guidelines how to uh, use the cloud and also how to classify the data before move to the cloud. So if the your data is very uh, uh, a high, uh, uh, high, then you have to put the, uh, the what is it, the um, uh, security more. If, if, if there's a low, then you just to, uh, keep the integrity and, the, and then the affability doesn't have to, uh, so, when the, the government agency buy the cloud services, they know uh, what their, uh, their data is. So I think uh, I like to thanks uh, ADB on this study, and I think this is going to be uh, our guideline. Also, uh, we will include on our guidelines. Thank you, uh, Art, and uh, thank you, me, uh, me and uh, I'm waiting for your uh, presentation to be sent to me. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, that was excellent, an excellent intervention. And uh, I will move right on to our next presenter, who is uh, Marcus Bartley Johns from Microsoft. Uh, he's the regional director there for government affairs and public policy. He works with stakeholders across the region to advance public policies for digital transformation. <laughs> this encompasses a wide range of issues at the intersection of technology and society including the responsible use of artificial intelligence, privacy and data protection, cybersecurity and digital diplomacy, skills and the future of work, and the digital transformation of indus industries like financial services. Prior to joining Microsoft, Marcus worked in public policy and economic development with the World Bank and Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. At the World Bank, he worked with governments on trade and digital economy policy reform projects and co-led flagship reports on the digital economy in Southeast Asia, 
and on global trade and poverty. Thank you very much for joining, Marcus, and over to you for your comments. Thanks very much, Ant, and uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone, um, wherever you are. Look, first, I want to say um, congratulations to the ADB for having put this working paper together. And I really want to echo the comments from Paxeni. I think this is a really useful collection of insights and experience and evidence to drive these conversations forward among governments and the private sector and other stakeholders on the role of cloud computing in meeting different development and policy challenges across the region. So I think it's a really great contribution that ADB has made through this work. What I wanted to do to start, um, I think for me, coming actually not from a deep technology background, Mayan was talking about her, you know, her father's own family experiences in different programming languages. I come more from the policy world. And I think one thing that I've observed and experienced when we talk about the role of cloud computing um, is that many governments don't really start with the technology choice or the technology solution. Actually, where this starts is with a policy challenge. Uh, it's about achieving better outcomes for, for governments and for our citizens, and then making the right technology choices that support that. And I think there are still some challenges that we need to go through as a region and really a world in this area is to make sure that we're having the same conversations. I think it can be very challenging to jump straight to the nuts and bolts of the technology solutions and a conversation that might be very comfortable for IT professionals or technologists. And then the risk is that some of the policymakers who really need to be driving this in areas like healthcare or education or infrastructure or agriculture across different parts of government can risk being left behind. So I think, again, a really important part of the work that the ADB is doing in this area and some of the examples that Mayan was sharing from the paper are bridging some of that gap between the technology solutions and the policy challenges that are being faced. I think what we've learned over the last 18 months through the experience of COVID really shows what's possible in terms of meeting some of those policy challenges and the role of new technology solutions like the cloud in achieving that. If we look at areas like education and what has been possible for not just advanced economies around Asia, but many developing economies as well to do in terms of scaling the provision of education to students um, many, many times over in a very short period of time, that kind of service delivery is really just not possible without the cloud. You know, we saw, for example, in Korea, the educational broadcasting system in Korea was able to use the public cloud to expand service capacity 500 fold, 500 times within two weeks, giving access to 3 million students to learn online through the educational broadcasting system. Or we saw in Australia, the collaboration platform that different government agencies were using saw an increase uh, threefold, a tripling in demand very rapidly as the increase of collaboration across ministries online picked up through COVID. And that kind of ability to keep the business of government running, to keep students learning, to keep the healthcare system functioning, uh, just wouldn't have been possible if governments weren't able to leverage that scalability, the efficiency, while still protecting privacy, security, that cloud services provides. So I think there really are a huge number of lessons for us to learn collectively from the last 18 months in how we can use the cloud and other technologies to meet policy challenges, and then think about taking those learnings and applying them to the next decade of digital transformation across the region. Some of the learnings that we've taken from the last 18 months and from some of the previous uh, work with governments and other stakeholders, well, I think what it comes down to is there's no one country that gets everything right but there are a set of key success factors that have emerged in our experience that make it much more likely that governments will succeed in using technology, using the cloud to achieve their public policy objectives. What does it mean that no government gets everything right? I think it means there are great opportunities to learn from each other. Uh, and again, I think that's a, a real opportunity for the ADB to play a role, for governments to get together, for um, researchers, for private sector players like Microsoft to foster that kind of learning. 
But, but there are four learnings that I want to point to. I think the first, and Mayan and Paxemi as well touched on this, is the importance of leadership and coordination across government. As I said, because this isn't just about technology and a, a kind of its selection of a particular IT product, it's actually about policy decisions, it's about the skills and people issues involved, and actually the transition to using cloud services for delivering government in a better way is really about a serious, very large process of change management that involves all parts of government that really requires political leadership to drive it forwards. And the mechanisms that allow governments to cooperate across the different ministry levels and across different levels of government as well. And we've seen many governments across the region take that step. We've seen Thailand, for example, establishing a digital government agency under the Prime Minister's leadership. We've seen Australia establishing a digital transformation agency to drive cloud adoption. And then we've seen, interestingly, in a country like Japan, that um, at one point in time had been seen as a leader on many digital initiatives, but then the government has recognised they want to drive more momentum. What Japan has done is establish a digital agency under the leadership of the Prime Minister to drive the change that's needed across government to make this happen. So the first learning really is that importance of political leadership to drive the changes necessary across government. The second area that we think is really important um, is looking at the role of policy and regulation in shaping how effectively the cloud can be used for governments to achieve their goals. And as Mayan mentioned, one really important learning here is the role of cloud-first policies. Having senior political backing across government that public cloud commercial solutions should be the first choice for the use of technology solutions across governments. That doesn't mean it's gonna be the right choice in every situation, but that it should be considered first. We've seen that driving some important change over time in the way governments think about the role of the cloud in addressing the challenges that they face. But we've also learned that cloud first policies aren't a silver bullet. And there are other parts of the policy and regulatory framework that are important as well. Privacy laws uh, are of course incredibly important in ensuring there's the trust from citizens that their data is being handled appropriately when it might move from one type of IT solution to the cloud. And the role of privacy laws in giving clarity across government on what rules should be followed uh, and clarity for private sector um, partners working with government as well on how they should be handling data appropriately. So looking at cloud first policies, but also privacy laws, cybersecurity frameworks, and then the role of things like a data classification policy that's clear across the whole of government and that allows the less sensitive data categories, the less sensitive business of government to move as easily as possible to the cloud uh, and using public cloud private sector solutions. So that second learning is, is about the importance of the policy and regulatory frameworks in making this happen. And the third is, is the role of a set of enablers like digital skills across government. What are the procurement frameworks and budget rules that are in place? What's the infrastructure that's in place? Um, you know, th th these all need to be working together in harmony with the policy and regulation and political leadership for these solutions to be used effectively. And just finally, across all of these areas, uh, partnership is essential. And I, I do think partnership with the private sector, with other stakeholders like the research community, with development organisations like the ADB. As I said, you know, there's no one country that gets everything right here, but the role of fostering learning and sharing from one country to another, from one industry to another, from one government agency to another is critical. And if we think about the infrastructure challenge alone, as Paxemi's example illustrated, the demand for digital services adoption in government is going to go far beyond the kind of infrastructure that governments can provide themselves. So there's a real role for public-private partnership in making that happen. I'm going to leave it there, um, but again, really appreciate the opportunity um, for this discussion and thanks again ADB for driving this agenda forward in the region. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Uh, very uh, sensible remarks and lots of thought has gone into the reflection about what's been happening in the last few months. Um, I want to pass the word now to our final respondent, and that is my colleague, Kelly Hattel, from our Southeast Asia uh, Regional Department. 
She's a senior financial sector specialist at ADB, and she focuses on micro, small, and medium enterprise development and improved access to finance across Southeast Asia. Prior to ADB, uh, Ms. Hattel consulted for various public and private sector agencies, microfinance institutions, and associations, where she provided technical expertise on expanding and deepening the reach of microfinance throughout Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. From 2001 to 2006, she worked for Acción Internacional, managing the microfinance network as a global association of 37 pioneer microfinance institutions from 28 countries. In this position, she facilitated cutting edge learning between, member and, uh, led, between members and led research activities on rural finance, financial consumer protection, and microinsurance. Over to you, Kelly. Thank you so much. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayan, for, uh, for presenting the, the, um, the summary of the paper. I think it, it really does lay out uh, very well the opportunities and challenges of adopting a, a cloud uh, computing system across government. Uh, what I would like to do is, is to kind of hone in on a, a specific case study within the fintech sort of subsector of, of this discussion and look at what the possibilities are uh, in, in terms of private sector, which will then link into uh, government and government services and, and, and cloud computing across government. So uh, I have been involved in um, implementing a larger uh, policy-based lending program with the Philippines called the Inclusive Finance Development Program. And the overall objective of this program is to increase financial inclusion across the Philippines. And as part of this, we've looked at uh, the level of financial inclusion, but also the, the quality and, and looking at different areas where we could have an influence. And part mm -hmm. of this is increasing the capacity of financial service providers. And so we look at in 2017, there were only three out of 10 Filipinos who had a bank account. A uh, large majority of, of, of these were in the southern part of the Philippines. And this was due to a number of constraints, lack of efficient technology infrastructure, uh, particularly in rural areas, and the high cost of reaching uh, underserved or, or unbanked clients and the, the risks that were involved in doing so. So we wanted to look at how could we use technology to increase financial inclusion and looking towards a cloud-based core banking system uh, seemed to provide a, a good uh, solution. And in doing so, we could address the, um, the outreach issue to, to reach more underserved and unbanked, uh, allow the development of, of new opportunities, different types of financial products and services uh, to these clients, uh, and to look at providing a better, better service, better experience for clients, uh, more personalized, efficient, and, and more cost-effective. And also to mitigate important risks, uh, various IT, strategic, and operational risks that are inherent in uh, hardware, based uh, legacy core banking systems, and also to reduce these expenses of the same types of systems. Uh, next slide, please. So when we started this pilot project, uh, we wanted to uh, support a financial institution of full migration to a cloud-based core banking system. Uh, and to have these uh, immediate outcomes here, as I mentioned earlier, with the overall outcome of increased financial inclusion. And we wanted to see how we could do this with one financial institution and help expand it uh, to others. And it's important to note that at the time in 2017, there were no uh, banks in the Philippines that were utilizing a, a full, uh, full cloud-based core banking system. Next slide, please. So actually in 2013, the BSP, the Central Bank of the Philippines, uh, Banco Central de Filipinas, had issued a circular that allowed cloud-based core banking uh, services for financial service providers, regulated deposit-taking financial service providers in the Philippines. But it wasn't until 2017 when uh, ADB and Cantilan Bank, which is a rural bank in the, in the southern part of the Philippines, uh, and a uh, fintech uh, provider, Oradian, uh, formed a partnership in 2017 uh, with the objective of uh, assisting this rural bank to migrate their core banking system. 
So in 2018, the time was spent on uh, migrating the systems, training, uh, doing a lot of um, focus group discussions with staff and, 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 and clients to understand uh, what this would mean in terms of the change management. Uh, and it was the, the bank ran two parallel, uh, two parallel systems, uh, core banking systems during this time. Uh, in 2019, early January 2019, the BSP gave Cantillon Bank the approval to switch their entire uh, hardware-based legacy system to the cloud. And it was also during this time that, that Cantillon Bank continued with their change management uh, and, and continued to uh, improve the services that they were offering. 2020, they recognized that in, in order to leverage the cloud, they wanted to look at how to improve the, the financial products and services that they were offering their clients. And so they partnered with uh, Apex, which is um, uh, based in Singapore to help develop uh, APIs for integrating uh, third party uh, service providers and also enhancing their digital roadmap. And of course, we know that 2020 was also uh, made more difficult to be undergoing this massive transformational change for, for a rural bank uh, because of COVID, but they, they pushed ahead with their digital roadmap. And, uh, and in 2021, they're now focusing on the end users digital access and field mobility with tablets. And, and using this uh, API layer so that they can in increase the offerings uh, to their clients. So the results that we saw from this pilot substantially improved connectivity through now 46 branches uh, that Cantillon has across their branch network, decreased IT resources, which the paper uh, also indicated would, would uh, take place with cloud computing, simplified reporting, not just at the back end, but also in terms of reporting to the BSP, the regulator, uh, which also concurrently went through their own reg tech transformation so that they could accept uh, re financial reports that would be reported through the cloud. Uh, and, and importantly, a more seamless customer ex experience. In terms of numbers, the client base increased from 95,000 in 2017 to 130,000 in 2020. And now, uh, as of last year, early last year, more than 25 financial institutions, rural bank and thrift banks, were given the green light by the BSP to uh, use cloud core banking. So it really was catalytic, which is what we are excited to see as a pilot project. They were able to do this because of the system change, a fundamental change in the mindset and company culture, parallel shift in doing business. And I would say this would be equal for other, for government agencies looking to adopt uh, cloud computing. Uh, it is a, a significant fundamental change in how uh, an, an organization does business. Um, it's important to have a clear long-term strategic approach and fundamental to have buy-in at all levels. So if it's government at the highest level of government, but those who are actually implementing the changes and those who are using the new systems. Uh, and also in the case of the Philippines, the regulator really was setting the agenda and driving the change for adopting a cloud-based core banking uh, ecosystem, I would say. Uh, and they were the ones who, who put in place a regulatory environment that was facilitating for this and really were a partner along this journey of, uh, early, 20, of early 2019, uh, Cantillon Bank becoming the first bank in the Philippines to uh, use cloud-based core banking. Uh, so that's my final slide. So I just would like to, to say that uh, since uh, we have um, uh, been working on this pilot project as a, as a 180B, I would say, I have colleagues who are participating in this now who've helped um, uh, provide support to this pilot project. We are now looking to assist other uh, rural banks in their digital transformation, particularly those that may not be able to make the, the types of upfront investments uh, to make this, this trans transformation and to bring in the learnings from this pilot. But also uh, in parallel, we're supporting the implementation of the Philippines, Philippines National Identification System, PhilSys, which is a foundational digital identification system. And mm -hmm. as part of this, this is going to enable government to really move towards cloud computing, to integrate, create this whole digital ecosystem with a, a digital national identification as a foundation. But when we look at the, the financial inclusion use case, having financial institutions that have already migrated to the cloud and are using uh, the cloud digital uh, to uh, to increase their own security and, and to be able to provide better experience for their clients, this is, is really kind of a streamline and, and, and fitting into the whole digital, uh, or sorry, uh, 
digital digital ecosystem and 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 finance uh, as a as a subsector. So I think this is a, a really fantastic start to um to an important discussion that uh, that our countries, the countries that we work in, uh, need to have because it's it's going to happen. We have to look at how to plan uh, appropriately and and look at all the different players within this full ecosystem. So thank you very much. I look forward to the questions. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks for the uh, the other uh, respondents. Um, great dialogue, and and good thing that we have uh, uh, multiple um, angles here on the uh, Q and A. So we've had some questions answered in the chat since we don't have a huge amount of time, and and I'll I'll basically um, jump in and and try to take on a couple of the questions that we haven't covered here. Um, first one is a very good one about um, can governments take a multi-vendor approach? And um, maybe I'll ask um, um, <clears throat> if we can ask uh, maybe Paxemi and Marcus um, to answer that question or if any other um, have any thoughts on it. I think it's a very good question because we do have high market concentration of leading cloud vendors. And what does that mean for uh, for governments um, uh, basically procuring these services? Maybe um, I don't know if Marcus or Paxemi, are you yeah, available? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm available. So uh, I think uh, for us uh, in Indonesia, we open for the uh, for the local and also uh, multinational uh, corporate and as, as you know in Indonesia now all the big uh, including markets company now is planning to build the uh, cloud services in Indonesia so we, we open this uh, uh, this opportunity uh, for both the player I, I don't great know. yes so so that's what we, our policy is uh, so we open for or put even the Singapore and Ecuador also negotiating to build in uh, Batam. Uh, we, we Indonesia are very open for this. <laughs> Great. So yeah. So you think that multi-vendor? It's not too complicated to have multiple providers, and uh, that's great. Yeah. Maybe uh, Marcus. So has, the, the important uh, thing is that the standard should be the same. So so that's uh, what we uh, we will put it on the on the first policy. So uh, that's what uh, our government Indonesia will do. Okay. Thanks. Maybe just to, to add to Thomas, I think to emphasize that point Paxemi made, it's great to have the choice of different cloud vendors. And of course, that's something we support. I actually think it is a pretty vibrant competitive market. If you look at how many different solution providers exist in a market like Indonesia, that there are actually lots of options available for governments. I think the key is having some objective, transparent standards to measure things like the security that a cloud vendor is going to provide or how they're going to protect the data of citizens. Uh, and that, you know, having that objective transparent benchmark is the key. And then it's really up to the government to decide based on that, which, which vendor do they want for the particular service or solution they're looking for. Great. Thanks. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I just, I would say, I think this is a very important area that, you know, uh, it, it is more efficient to pick one cloud vendor and, and build your whole um, ecosystem around them. There's some efficiency, but you also have to manage, you know, competition and uh, market concentration. So, um, and it's very easy for a government to select a set of services you know, with one vendor and another set of services with another and have them even interacting um, and I think there are some more and more tools where you can even port services from one to another effectively. It's uh, becoming uh, easier to do, but it, it's, it is an extra complexity, especially um, as, you know, Mayan mentioned, the all different types of uh, hybrid cloud and, and uh, other, other, other things that all could be mixed together. Um, so why don't we go to the next question? Um, I wanted to bring this question, um, which is... Um, a great question, which is, you know, we know Indonesia, as Paxemi said, you're big enough that you will have the big vendors setting up shop there. But what about smaller countries in the region where you will not have all four cloud service vendors setting up uh, infrastructure there? Is it necessary um, to uh, really figure this out with the citizens' data? You know, uh, can you store 
citizens data on foreign cloud servers. And maybe I'll start with Kelly, because you have maybe this problem with the Philippines. Um, I'm assuming the uh, bank um, services that are being served are not necessarily um, in the Philippines, or, or is that a consideration, you know, since they're not all the cloud services providers have, um, you know, have infrastructure there? Sure. Uh, thank you for your question. I was busy looking at the, the Q&A and typing an answer. Uh, I think um, it's actually really interesting because if you look at uh, the service uh, provider that, uh, that partnered with Cantilan Bank, their, their proposed solution was, uh, was in Europe for the, for the, the server, for the, the cloud-based uh, system. And uniquely, Philippines, uh, even as of 2013, allowed uh, the server to be hosted outside of the country, outside of the Philippines, which is 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 quite uh, unique. And I think that this is really what enabled the this first mover to be able to um, to go forward because they were able to to address the data privacy concerns because it was actually hosted uh, outside of the country. And 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 but I've also participated in in. Sorry, I've also participated in uh, other regulator discussions, and there are, uh, I would say, seventy-five percent of the regulators that were that were discussing said no, we would not allow uh, this to be uh, the cloud to be hosted outside of our country. And so I would say, based on this uh, this uh, example that uh, that I provided, it was um, it, it was. Uh, it was successful and it really depends on the, the protections that are in place and there needs to be the government has to have a clear set of criteria that they're using uh, the national privacy commissioner whatever um, other entity is is involved in, in in data data privacy and security but uh so there needs to be a thorough assessment of of of, of data privacy and security but that's really where the the important step lies it's not necessarily where it's hosted. It could be even safer if it's hosted outside of the country, uh, to be to be uh, quite honest. Great, thanks. I think your point is, is very well taken. And we actually mentioned this in the paper that uh, security is really not very closely tied to the physical location of the data, especially now that almost all data is encrypted. The cloud provider actually doesn't even have access to the data that they're hosting. And uh, if the um, security is handled properly, uh, it doesn't matter that much where the data is. Although, of course, the public has to understand this and the public would uh, also react if they found out where the, their data was, you know, um, somewhere that they wouldn't expect it to be. So there are, there are really complicated issues here, but I, I do think that the main point is to understand what the security issues are and um, you know how to handle um, that effectively, and then there should be more opportunities. But I also think that the cloud vendors are going to move uh, more to opening um, more sites in different countries because they, I think, they see the demand and they they see the the need for it. So um, yeah, I think there there will be a balance there. Um, so uh, can we, we want, I want to go into the, there was a question that was very interesting. I think also Kelly, you might be able to answer about, um, in the Philippines, you have, um, uh, Islamic, uh, community that's being served. And, um, there's a question about Islamic banking and is this part of the, um, the solution, um, you know, that Cantillion can, can offer? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a bit more of a Islamic finance type of, of, of question rather than, than, than cloud. But I would say that, you know, a cloud-based system allows more flexibility and, and, and transparency in how, uh, how you are calculating either it's interest or fees or, or whatever it may be. And it can be adapted for the type of model, uh, financial model that you're using. So uh, I, I can't I can't respond actually in the in the case of Cantilan Bank, but there are a large number of uh, Islamic uh, finance um, providers, uh, especially non governmental organizations in, in the Philippines, and and that would in my mind it wouldn't prevent them from using uh, cloud cloud based uh, core banking. I think it, it it actually would make it more transparent and and uh, more straightforward depending on the parameters that are set. 
Great. Yeah, that's that's a great point because uh, on cloud, you can actually roll out more services um, to more people that are differentiated um, and leverage the functionality of the, you know, the core banking platform uh, more widely. So we have a question about Indonesia. Um, so for Paxemi, um, I think the question is about, you have a morator moratorium on data centers. Um, is What does this mean for uh, folks like AWS and Google setting up a local presence? Um, is that related? So the, the moratorium is for the government uh, agency to build their data center. So we are stopped. Like I, I mentioned right now, we, we just do the assessment. Uh, throughout the Indonesia, there is a 2,700 uh, data center, but mostly it's a, a, a server room. So we are stopped there. So we are not allow any government agency to build or to, uh, to uh, buy a server. We are forcing them to use the availability uh, cloud services that have uh, has in, uh, in Indonesia. So it's not- Great, thank you. Not, not for the private sector to build, but for the government to build. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. <clears throat> yes, I, that's a great to clarify because you um, obviously can take advantage of the private sector uh, more effectively and not have to build so many um, separate data centers for the, um, for the government. Um, so um, uh, let's see, we have so many questions. I think we're going to uh, run out of time here. We only have a few minutes left, but... Um, I, I wanted to pick one more um, and a question about building data centers in the local country to solve latency issues. Um, is that something that we find is important? Um, maybe uh, I can ask um, Marcus and uh, Mayan about that one. Yeah, it's a good question. I think in general, one of the benefits of the hyperscale, so, you know, the globally distributed cloud computing infrastructure that private sector providers play is actually the latency is much lower than some of the other options that might exist if the infrastructure is built completely within the country. Uh, so that's just at a, as a general you know, principle. But one thing that you are seeing companies like Microsoft do is build more data centers that are closer to the governments and businesses that you know are using our services. And one of the benefits of that is there can be a, a decrease in latency, but we're talking about very small differences here um, in performance. But it is something as we've announced new data centers in countries like Indonesia, um, there will be some, you know, some performance benefits for customers there, in addition to being able to use the hyperscale infrastructure that's already present. Great, thanks. Mayan, do you have any thoughts no, on that I one? Think I think Marcus pretty much answered that. That uh, I've been answering the questions. Thank you very much, everybody, for very robust question and answer. I've been typing nonstop mm -hmm. uh, and answering the question. Yeah, but it really, the location doesn't really matter. I think that building, um, borrowing from people is definitely the way to be going. Thank you. And I think there's another question about internet exchange points and um, uh, hosting of... Um, uh, of con content uh, network providers that uh, also feeds in there that it's not just about the um, the cloud vendor, but what what exact services are being used and where's the data flowing around. So um, yeah, that's that's great, and I agree. Uh, with me and we've had a very robust uh, Q and A, and um, I want to thank everybody for joining and participating so actively, and and thank our. Um, panelists and our authors. Uh, we really hope to get a lot of traction out of this paper and we will be also introducing uh, more work in this area. And, and I'd also like to thank our partners who helped us review this, uh, AWS and Microsoft and Alibaba. We had a great um, partnership with uh, some of the key industry players in um, peer reviewing and um, uh, we would, would love to get more comments. If folks have um, any other uh, inputs, um, we could potentially address those offline. So with that, I think we will um, call the uh, webinar to a close uh, so we don't run over. And uh, thanks again for everybody joining. And um, we're looking forward to working on, more on cloud as we come out of the pandemic. Thanks and have a great rest of your day.